Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Live remarks in a candid conversation with Jay Powell, the Fed chair, uh, making a bit of news in his prepared remarks in the Q&A that followed here live on Bloomberg Radio and TV, still with his eye on a 2% inflation target. He does not think inflation is reversing higher, but also does not expect interest rate cuts until there's more confidence on inflation, suggesting the Fed has more time before it needs to make decisions on cuts. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington alongside Kaylee Lines, the Wednesday edition of Balance of Power. Kaylee, interesting after quite a bit of Fed speak the last couple of days mm-hmm. here to hear uh, the, the Fed chair kind of stretch out for the better part of an hour and get into this. Yeah, and some of what we heard today was reminiscent of what we heard from him just on Friday, which is that this Fed, specifically Chairman Powell, is a study of Fed history, mm-hmm. if you will. And mm-hmm. decades ago, when they were trying to fight inflation and decided to ease back on tighter policy too early, right. it had ramifications. And he essentially warned of that again in these remarks. He talked about the idea that reversing rates too soon could risk a reversal in progress, mm-hmm. but loosening policy too late or too little could impact economic activity and right. employment. He he went on to say in the Q&A that there is no risk-free path for him and his colleagues. Well, that's for sure. Um, And, you know, interesting to hear him speaking to the causes of inflation as Mm -hmm. well. If we're going back in history, you were making note in the newsroom uh, about his repeated references to the supply side here, because there's still an ongoing argument in Washington, though actually some feel like it's settled at this point, as to whether Joe Biden really stoked inflation and Donald Trump, for that matter, by overspending. Yeah, you hear that a lot, especially from conservative wings here in Washington, that it was fiscal policy that contributed to this inflation. Mm -hmm. Trillions of dollars being poured into the economy in the aftermath of the pandemic. But what we heard from Chairman Powell today was he said inflation was not strictly about demand overheating. To your point, Joe, he said it was about the supply side. He did say he does think there could be more gains to be had on the supply side, but he even talked about it in terms of the labor market. Of course, the other part of the Fed's dual mandate, talking Mm -hmm. about the supply and demand Uh, in the balance we are seeing right now, but really putting emphasis on supply, which I thought was interesting and I'm sure perked up a lot of ears here in Washington. Yeah, for sure. I suspect that Enda was listening as well. Our own uh, Enda Curran, Bloomberg Economics uh, reporter, is with us now, having just been live blogging on the terminal and at Bloomberg.com about 30 seconds ago. It's nice of you to (laughs) to stop for typing for a moment and uh, thanks for letting us pull you away. What got your attention in terms of newsmaking headlines today from Jay Powell? News making nothing so much new. He's saying, look, we're not totally sold that inflation's back to where it should be yet. Yeah. So he didn't give any hint that they're going to cut rates anytime soon. So that probably won't change the rate cutting story. But I think as Kaylee was saying, it was some more expansive chat. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, he made the point that when you look back now, a lot of the inflation was because there was such a shortage of everything, right? You couldn't buy a new car, you couldn't get semiconductors, you couldn't get workers. So that was a big part of it. And he's making the point that, that that's being on one now, so that's helping things. That does go to the political debate, though, of course, because lots of people say the current administration spent too much money, right? right? That's what drove up inflation. Still hear it every day. (laughs) Exactly. So those comments might resurface over time. So Mm -hmm. nothing new, I think, on where rates are going for any any homeowners listening, but uh, more expansive thinking about the broader economy. Yeah, I thought it was interesting on the supply side. When he was basically questioned about whether or not the Fed's monetary policy, their primary tool of using interest rates to influence the economy, whether it was still working to the same extent, considering we've seen the growth that we have. He brought that back to supply as well. He did say that monetary policy is broadly working as expected, but definitely taking note of the fact that the economy has proven so resilient even in the face of this tighter policy. Yeah, and one of the points of resilience he made was population growth or immigration. Yeah. Interesting. Now, he was at pains to say, I'm not here to talk about immigration policy. He was really <laughs> kicking that back to the politicians, but he was saying the numbers speak for themselves. The extra workers that have arrived in the US, and I'm one of those, I suppose, <laughs> uh, have, have, are one of the reasons why growth is stronger than expected yeah. and has offset inflation as well by taking the pressure of of wages. So I think his comments on immigration, again, there's a political aspect to it, very interesting from the economic viewpoint too. Immigration and the job market as a whole, he, he doesn't always have an opportunity to speak to the other mandate outside of a news conference at a Fed meeting or maybe an opportunity like this on a panel. We tend not to get into it too much uh, it, when he's speaking to lawmakers in congressional hearings, for instance, but to hear Jay Powell speak to the enormous social good Uh, that a tight labor market brings the country is kind of a different shade from 
the chair. Yeah, these comments, as I was saying, they were a bit more expansive. Yeah. It wasn't just talking about PCE readings or anything like <laughs> that. And he, he was making the point how important this is. And he has in the past said as well how important anchoring inflation expectations mm. is for the general public. And he said that again today. So his comments are infused with the public role that the... Is Fed he auditioning for this job again? <laughs> this, is, this all seems very Biden-friendly. Well, I, I don't think he's party political. I mean, I think he'd be, he'd be at pains to stress that. But he's just making the point that he believes the Fed has this critical role to play in the economic well-being and welfare of the, of the public. Mm -hmm. And he seems to believe in that. And that's why today we got a little bit of a flavour of that. And he spoke to public service as well, the, the, the virtues of public service also. Well, and we keep hearing from him, as we've heard from the number of Fed speakers over the last several days, that they want to be confident about inflation returning to that 2% mark. And of course, inflation expectations factors into this as well. He said there's no indication, to your point, uh, that inflation expectations are not consistent with 2% inflation. But are we getting more clarity as to what exactly the metric for confidence is? If, if it's a series of readings that are consistently going down, if it's more a pattern or a trend, or is this still just kind of a broad idea that the Fed talks about, but we don't actually have a real understanding of what it is they mean. I think it probably reflects the inflation scare we had in January in particular. Remember sure. those numbers came in a bit hotter than expected, and, and February as well showing plenty of stickiness. So in truth, the Fed are probably over there saying, what we need to see is a few more months to confirm that the disinflation story is still intact. And if they got a few more months of good inflation reads, then I think that would light up the Fed rate cutting debate. Mm. But if that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. um, then we get back, you heard him talk about the 1970s, he does not want to repeat yeah. that mistake. So mm -hmm. he's not, he doesn't want to cut too soon, basically. All right, Bloomberg's end of current sprinting all over the newsroom yeah, to cover you, Chairman Anna. Powell uh, in his remarks for us. Thank you. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Really interesting here. We know that Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and they confirmed yet again in Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin, that they will be their party's nominees. They also reminded us of the great weaknesses that they have both been experiencing on the campaign trail. I'm not just talking about age here. I'm not talking about Donald Trump's legal problems necessarily either, although it's interesting how some folks can read this. Donald Trump got 75% of the vote, at least in all of these states. But guess what? Someone named Nikki Haley got at least 10% of the vote in all four states. Remembering that phenomenon in Georgia, they said, well, listen, she hadn't dropped out yet. People were voting early. Well, here's another test. And for Joe Biden, at least 80 percent of the vote in each of these states. But the uncommitted ballot option gobbled up as much as 15 percent in some states in Rhode Island, 14.9 percent uncommitted. And I wish we had more time with Jim Ellis, but I'm glad we've got a couple of minutes with a voice of experience from the campaign. Here is the president of Ellis Insight. Jim, great to have you back. How are you looking at these results now, knowing that Nikki Haley is out of this race? Joe, thanks so much. It's good to be back with you. The, you know, really, the uh, I think the votes would have been the same if the Republicans had a a um, uncommitted choice as well. I think Nikki Haley was the mm -hmm. only option on that ballot, and so both parties, both candidates, have about ten to fifteen percent where they need to. Uh, reach out to try to get back and have a united, fully united base going into the election. So it's not particularly surprising. And, you know, these numbers for both are actually quite good. The interesting part, though, again, mm -hmm. I've been studying the turnout in these primaries all across the nation. And mm -hmm. Last night, the uh, three of the states, more Democrats voted, which you would expect from Connecticut, Rhode Island, excuse me, and New York. But um, mm -hmm. other states... In fact, we've had 32, rather, where we've had both parties vote. And in 24 of the 32, we've seen more Republicans turn out in their primary than Democrats in theirs. And that shows sort of a lack of enthusiasm for Biden. And that's why you see his campaign moving further to the left on his message, because they need to unite that Democratic Party for turnout in November. And sometimes... Primary turnout is a precursor to what happens in the general elections. Yes. That's why I pay a lot of attention to it. And I think it's quite interesting right now. Well, so there's no Nikki Haley uh, for Joe Biden here. Uh, I don't think uh, Dean Phillips is necessarily 
creating a protest vote. Of course, he's left the campaign as well. What is this uncommitted uh, movement for Joe Biden equal to you? Is If there's a ceasefire in Israel, for instance, will we still see numbers like this? Very hard to say. I, I think that Israel issue is the toughest one Biden has to deal with because it seems like no matter what he does, he can't come out ahead politically. And so a lot of that uncommitted vote we're seeing in these primaries surrounds, revolves around that Palestinian Israel issue. And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens here in the next few months because it could be determinative in a lot of ways for the general election simply because particularly in states like Michigan and Minnesota, where you have a large uh, Muslim population, uh, Arab population that uh, are responding negatively towards what Biden has been doing in in Israel. And if that's the case, you know, particularly in Michigan, that block of votes that voted almost solely with Biden in 2020, yep. and if it doesn't come back for him this time, you know, Michigan's going to be close enough where that could make a big difference. And so this is a very important issue and a very difficult one for Biden. Donald Trump is trying to own the term bloodbath. And I wonder yes. your thoughts on this. Um, it's it's not an equivalency, but I remember when Joe Biden took the term Bidenomics, uh, which was uh, really just kind of a joke. It was something that was written about in the Wall Street Journal. And he tried to own it. Donald Trump's doing the same yes. here now. In fact, the, they've launched a website for crying out loud called borderbloodbath.com or something. Um, remembering that that remark upset a lot of people when he referred to it with a, a reference to the auto sector. We heard again, though, last evening about how uh, immigrants crossing the border illegally, migrants are animals. He said they are not human beings. And I wonder, as you consider the challenge that Joe Biden is facing, for instance, with progressives on Israel, will Donald Trump face a challenge with this kind of trail of rhetoric that he's leaving once this does become a general election vote in November? Well, once again, I guess it's Donald Trump being Donald Trump. And I think mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot more of this. A lot of people think if he would just maybe change his rhetoric a little bit, that he would do a lot better. But it doesn't look like he'll ever do that. And obviously, he's trying to bring greater attention with this rhetoric to the problem we've got at the border, because now everybody's sort of saying, oh, this is a serious problem. You notice some Democrat ads, particularly in uh, places like Arizona and Nevada, the Senator Jackie yeah. Rosen is just out with a new ad talking about how she stood up to her party on the border. I'm not sure when she did that, but that's what she's saying, and yeah. that she's for more border security. You've got Ruben Gallego, who will be the Democratic nominee for the Senate in Arizona, doing the same thing. I think mm -hmm. the border issue, I really think in terms of a vote driver, it's one thing to be an important issue. It's another to be a vote driver. But in those particular states that border Mexico, those that issue is going to be a driver. And I think we're seeing the campaigns already starting to respond to that. And that's what Trump's trying to do with this rhetoric. Whether, whether or not that's going to engender more votes for him, that remains to be seen. But that's obviously what he's yeah. trying to do. Well, it's funny, you're talking about actual border states. He was in Michigan making these remarks uh, over the weekend here, and that has been a successful strategy for the former president, right, to make every state a border state, Jim. It is, and that's what they tried to do in that New York special election when Santos was expelled. That's right. And it really didn't work because that that district voted as it was drawn. It was drawn as a lean Democratic seat. That's how it voted. And I think it's one thing to talk about the border in these border states. I think it's another thing where people do think it's important, but they don't see it as much when they're 2,000 miles away. And therefore, I think there's a big question. I think we learned this on the abortion issue in 2020. It's a big difference between what people say is an important issue to them and what is actually a vote driver. What will actually get you to go out to the vote, to vote on that particular issue? Abortion proved to be that for the Democrats. The Republicans are trying to make mm -hmm. the border that for them. And I think that probably does work in those states we were talking about. But the further you get yeah. away from the border, I'm not sure it does. So we'll find out. But that's what Trump is trying to do. No doubt about it. Always a fascinating conversation with Jim Ellis. It's good to see you, Jim. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube.
Welcome to the Wednesday edition of Balance of Power, the fastest show in politics here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Indeed, I'm Joe Matthew in Washington alongside Kaylee Lines. Great to be back together again on this day after the primary. Yes, we have front runners and presumptive nominees. It's mathematically set here, Kaylee, but mm -hmm. we're still looking at results in some of these primaries to gauge what's really been a protest vote for both of them. And when you look at the states, Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin, all of them showed the Achilles heel for Trump and Biden. Yeah, for Trump, it showed up in the fact that there is still a chunk of the Republican primary electric that is choosing to vote for Nikki Haley, mm -hmm. even though her campaign ended last month, several weeks ago, four right. to five weeks yeah. at this point. And for Biden, it is in the uncommitted vote in the case of uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island, mm -hmm. or the uninstructed vote in Wisconsin, as there was the Listen to Wisconsin movement that was looking for 20,000 voters to essentially protest Biden and his yeah. policies, given that was his margin of victory over Trump in that state in 2020. And they got that, it done. Those are the numbers we got. So Laura Davison is with us uh, right now, fresh from the campaign trail, and I think a meeting that we may have pulled her out of for this conversation. <laughs> Laura, it's great to see you. Uh, really interesting stuff here. The numbers speak for themselves. Nikki Haley took at least 10% of the vote in all four states in which there were uh, Republicans voting last evening. Why don't we pick through these one by one? It was different, it seemed, in Georgia because she had still been in the race when early voting began. What does last night tell us? So this tells us that there are still, you know, voters who are dissatisfied. I will point out, though, that she's getting a lot uh, smaller of the share of the pie than she was yeah. when she was still in the race. She was getting, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent, and now it's more like 10 percent. So that, you know, does signal that people are saying, you know, look, I got to get behind uh, and, and support the nominee or just not show up to vote at all, uh, mm -hmm. which is really what you see in these low turnout elections where you have, uh, you know, it's really sort of the diehard supporters or the people who always vote because they don't want to break their streak. And what both campaigns and a lot, a lot of political strategists will say is, look, when we get to November and it's Trump or Biden and maybe RFK Jr. or some other third party person on the calendar or mm -hmm. on the ballot, people are going to say, look, you know, th th your choices between Trump and Biden and, you know, r lodging a protest vote at that point is a much bigger and more difficult decision for a lot of voters yeah. to make. Yeah, it's important to make the distinction here between a primary in which, to Joe's point, you already know that these are the presumptive nominees. Your vote is not really making that much of a difference in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just a way for you to signal. So when we look in Wisconsin, for example, the 48,000 voters that voted uninstructed. How is the Biden campaign likely to look at those voters? Do they see them as real risk of becoming Trump voters? Or is it more about trying to convince those voters ultimately to turn out for him? This particular faction they see as people who will just not turn out at all. And this is what we saw in Michigan. A lot of the organizers there were very mm -hmm. vocal saying, look, I don't think that Trump's going to be any better, um, you know, in the Israel Gaza situation, but I really just can't support Biden. So this is this is really the risk. And in states like Michigan, Michigan and Wisconsin, where, you know, the margin could be decided by 10,000 votes, 3,000 votes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's going to be very, very close. Having all those people show up will be very important for both Biden and Trump. Uh, the term bloodbath is uh, becoming one that the Trump campaign is now trying to seize on and control after having had some uh, heard some controversy surrounding his use of that term uh, in a reference to the auto sector. If he didn't get elected, it would be a bloodbath. This is weeks ago. They have actually got a website up now, bidenbloodbath.com with a reference to the border, and it shows the number of violent crimes in which undocumented, uh, undocumented immigrants have been accused. Is this a winning formula for the Trump campaign to embrace that term? I think it's too soon to say if it's a winning formula, but this is a strategy we have really started to see Trump use in the past couple of weeks. Yesterday, when he spoke in Michigan on his podium, there was a sign, you know, saying, you know, Biden's border bloodbath, um, and he started, you know, using a lot of the same um, rhetoric that Biden has been using against him. He's a, uh, you know, a danger to democracy. You know, there won't be any more elections if this guy is elected. You see, he, you know, you could take just the transcript of some of the things that Trump is saying and be like, who said it, Trump or Biden? <laughs> It'd be a little unclear. So we're, you know, kind of starting to see. Uh, you know, some of this of, of Biden taking, uh, you know, the criticism that's being lobbed at him or Trump taking the criticism and then just turning it right back on his opponent. And bloodbath is sort of a key example there of, you know, something he said, it'll be a bloodbath. And he said, no, no, not I'm not causing the bloodbath. Biden is causing the bloodbath. All right, Laura Davison, always great to have you join us. She, of course, is politics editor here at Bloomberg, joining us in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thank you so much. And now we want to have uh, turn it over to Charlie Cook now, who is joining us remotely. He is the founder of the Cook Political Report, now a contributor there. Charlie, it's always great to see you here on Bloomberg TV and, and hear you on Bloomberg Radio. When you look at the primary results from yesterday, and let's maybe focus first on what they mean for the incumbent president, Joe Biden. You look at Wisconsin, even Rhode Island and Connecticut, there are 
thousands of voters who are choosing uncommitted, uninstructed. How should we think about how those individuals are likely to vote, how they're likely to behave come November? Yeah, I, uh, first, thanks for having me on. I, I think uh, I would not look too, too, too closely at what happened, what was going on in the primaries for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, we knew on the Democratic side, um, you know, we've seen from polling, from Bloomberg polling, that, uh, uh, you know, there's a substantial percentage of Democrats who just think President Biden is too old and should not be running. And so that they might pick, you know, some other name or whatever, or none of the above, or what, you know, that's not a shocker. And I don't think on the Republican side, I don't think that there is a Haley vote in that sense, because if she had gone to court and had her name changed to none of the above, she'd probably do better than she did. I mean, that it is basically that is the option if you're not for Trump. And that we knew that there, you know, there is a constituency out there. But one of the things that uh, uh, the New York Times did did an analysis based on what their findings in Georgia and data files and all this, where they found that the Haley voters were pretty much people that had voted for Biden, uh, you know, in the last election. So I don't think that there is a a a, a big group of people wearing Haley jerseys jerseys that are you know, uh, run around in the political process. It's just more people that aren't for Trump or people that aren't for Biden. And, uh, you know, there's going to be defections on each side or more likely where they just sim simply don't vote. And that's actually, you know, one of the bigger problems for Democrats is with young voters, with Latinos, with African-Americans is, uh, you know, they're worried about defections, but they're also worried about uh, a lack of enthusiasm and turnout. Hey, Charlie, we were lucky to have you on Super Tuesday as you sat at the table here reminding us that it was not very super, <laughs> that things uh, were foregone, that we were looking at an inevitable equation in this case with two candidates nobody seemed to really even want. I wonder now, as we enter April and looking at, you mentioned our poll, Bloomberg and Morning Consult, our swing state poll showing Donald Trump winning the majority of them. Today, Wall Street Journal shows Donald Trump leading Joe Biden in six key states. Is this thing over the general, that is? I don't think it's over, but I think it's it's definitely uphill for President Biden. That, that you know, I, I think it'd be foolish for anybody to say Biden cannot win. But if you mm -hmm. were just totally not the factors that are arguing for a Biden win, uh, politically speaking or electorally speaking, and and, and for a Trump win, um, it's it's really 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 uphill. And you you know and and as you said, people they should first of all ignore national polls. I mean they're they're good for mm -hmm. directional. You know is Smith gaining or Jones lo losing? You know that sort mm -hmm. of thing. But this election is going to be decided in. Uh, six or seven states, depending upon whether you include North Carolina or not. And the way to look at it is to look at the, the Bloomberg Morning Consult poll, the Wall Street Journal swing state poll, the New York Times Siena College, uh, and then individual uh, single shot polls that uh, CNN, Fox, and other news organizations are doing. Uh, that That's what's going to tell us. But this is, um, you know, I think the framework is going to be uh, this is not going to be a referendum on Donald Trump, that when you have an incumbent running for, for re-election, it's basically, do you want to renew that incumbent's contract? Yes or no? Stay the course, time for a change. And that's what it was about mm -hmm. in 2020 when Trump was president. And that, I think that's what's going to be here. But uh, as I mentioned, I think on Super Tuesday with you, that uh, you know this is the first presidential election since 1892 that you have back-to-back -back presidents running against each other. And what that means is it invites a side-by-side -side comparison for that eight to 10% of that are pure independents in the middle that aren't for more or less locked in for each side. It's gonna be who is better mm -hmm. off for me. And those people, they vote on not the economy, but their economy. And they don't vote, on, they wouldn't know the CPI from NCIS but they do know the cost of living. <laughs> One thing that's really, really, really there. But uh, you know, the, the eight to ten percent in the middle, um, they're not a whole lot of Bloomberg watchers and listeners. There, uh, these are people that are uh, a lot less information driven. I'm going to get that CPI and NCIS line printed on a <laughs> T-shirt, Charlie Cook. But when we talk about that eight 
to 10 percent. It's about who they vote for, yes, but it's also about whether they vote at all, whether they're going to turn out. And I know you said that you see this election cycle as really an uphill climb for Biden, but he is winning the resource battle. He is far ahead on fundraising. He is far more cash to spend. When you have a cash pile like that that you can use uh, to drive turnout, how should we think about how that might change the dynamics once he starts deploying that in a more material way? First of all, thank you for adding uh, about turnout because it is absolutely true that the 8 to 10 percent that are the pure independents, that they vote, they pay attention less, they pay attention later, and they end up voting in lower numbers. So that then the, the 90, 91, 92 percent that are partisans on one side uh, or the other. So good point. Thank you for thank you for making that. Um, Look, it's always better to have more money than the other candidate. And the more you can have, the better. But uh, in politics, basically, there's a law of diminishing returns where there's a point where you have a lot of money and that, that the incremental value of every additional dollar isn't that great. And the other thing is the higher the visibility of the office, the higher the office, the less important campaign spending is. And that on a, you know, a state rep race, a city council race or whatever, you know, lower uh, where there's not there's less news coverage. Um, campaign spending is a lot more important there. But in a presidential race, I mean, let me ask you, what could a TV ad possibly do or say that would change somebody's mind one way or the other about Joe Biden or Donald Trump? You know, they've already got 10 million data points there. And so money, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for the Biden people that they're going to have more money. And that's always makes, you know, you have to make fewer choices. But uh, in a presidential race, money is not that 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 determinative, but it sure is better to have it than not. And, and, by, and Trump, hmm. they're going to have plenty of money. I mean, you, you have candidate money, you know, in other words, the Trump for president. You've got super PAC money. You've got various other mm -hmm. entities and party things. I mean, there, there's a lot of money sloshing around this system. I've only got about a minute here, Charlie Cook. I have to ask you about rhetoric. As I just asked you irresponsibly if this race was already over, knowing that so much can happen in seven to eight months' time. We heard again from Donald Trump over the weekend about not just the bloodbath uh, reference, but migrants. He called them animals again. Democrats, he said, this is a quote, Democrats said, please don't call them animals. I said, no, they're not humans. They're animals, unquote. Is this kind of thing moving the needle for anybody or does everybody know Donald Trump for whom he is? To your point, this is a former president we're talking about. I, I think Donald Trump is much more, I mean, I, I, he's got part of the job down pat and that is throwing red meat to his base and keeping them jacked up. And there, there's just nobody better uh, th than that. Uh, making arguments that would appeal to swing voters, uh, maybe not so much, but he may be banking yeah. on that group uh, vote turning out in, 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 in lower numbers. But, you know, the thing is with take the border, I think a lot of this is sort of more of a competence thing. I mean, you can't see the video mm -hmm. of dozens and dozens or hundreds of people come over the border and say, geez, uh, yeah, right. boy, that really is efficiency and competence. And, uh, they, they're doing a heck of a job. Yeah. Um, it undermines the, the, the sort of effectiveness of the administration. And Well, Charlie, I wish we had more time and we'll find it next time. Charlie Cook with us on Balance of Power, only on Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. The news we were following here in Washington today, in addition to everything that's happening in financial markets and with specific companies, is it is the aftermath of a series of primaries, yes, debatable indeed. to the extent to which Further primaries matter when Trump and Biden already have mathematically locked up their respective Republican and Democratic nominations. But still, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York yesterday, those voters made their voices heard. And there may be some troubling signs for both candidates in the results yeah. that we saw. And if you're a viewer or listener to this program, this will sound familiar to you. The uncommitted vote uh, mm -hmm. for Joe Biden that he has seen certainly through the, the Midwestern states with an eye on his Israel policy for Donald Trump. 
It's been this Nikki Haley vote, kind of a protest vote in disguise that is really taking form here a little bit more because she, you know, wasn't on the ballot when these states started voting. So we assemble our panel. Glad to say Rick Davis is with us, Bloomberg politics contributor, Republican strategist, joined by Democratic strategist Jim Kessler, of course, founder at Third Way. It's great to have both of you gentlemen with us and appreciate the time here. Um, I'd like to pick through each of these one by one. And Jim Kessler, I'll start with you on Joe Biden. When you look at the numbers here, obviously we have two presumptive nominees and no one is questioning who's going to be going to the convention here. But the uncommitted ballot option took between eight and 15% away from Joe Biden's results in the states where it was an option in Rhode Island. It was almost 15%. Is this something Joe Biden needs to worry about or again, a game in the primary cycle? I would worry about other things more. Like, look, if you look at post Super Tuesday, when really the the race is uncontested, Joe Biden has won 89% of post Super Tuesday votes. Donald Trump has won 79% of post Super Tuesday votes. I think they both have work to do. I think Donald Trump has more work to do. Some of the votes that Biden have, has lost, they're freebies. People are like, it's a protest vote. I think if Biden is trying to get those votes rather than getting votes in the center and, you know, maybe trying to do better on a, on the border, on crime, on those issues, I think that would be a mistake. I think he's got to aim for the center. And if he loses some votes on the left because of Israel and Hamas, he loses some votes on the left. Well, but Jim, I wonder if when we're thinking about the left, we're thinking about more specific demographics than that, though, when we think about this protest vote, right? And I, I take your point about how people may view this as a freebie because it's a primary election, not a general one. But but there's also the question of whether those voters are still going to turn out for him in the general, specifically young voters. This is a, a demographic that was crucial to getting Biden elected the first time around in 2020. And when you look at the breakdown of where these uncommitted or uninstructed votes were showing up, it's college towns. This is a pattern we have seen repeatedly. How concerned should he be about young people and making sure that the young people actually turn out on election day? He should be concerned. And, you know, he's got a message to send to college students. He's done things on student debt. He's done a lot of things on the environment. He's done things on LGBT issues. He's done things on, on abortion. If that's not a, enough for some young voters on the left, then that's the way it's gonna be. And then the votes he has to gain are those Nikki Haley voters. I, you can't lean too far to the left to try and get those voters because you're gonna lose votes from the center. This election is gonna be won or lost in the center. Rick Davis, uh, walk us over to Donald Trump's side of the race here. If Nikki Haley is pulling at least 10%, in all four states we're talking about here, we may have set a new baseline. That's less than certainly she was pulling in the early states. Is that a write-off for the Trump campaign? Is it a factor that he should worry about? In Mar-a-Lago, <clears throat> excuse me, is worried about uh, this primary vote at this point. Uh, uh, most voters know if they're gonna go to a Republican primary, they know the state of the primary, they know that Biden or Trump's already got it locked up. Uh, and, and so they have different motivations for casting a vote against him. Uh, I've never seen a primary vote like this influence a general election. Uh, in other words, by and large, Republicans come back to the Republican fold, Democrats come back to the Democratic fold, and then you have the issues of intensity. And intensity will matter probably more to Biden than to Trump. Trump has a very fired up base. His base is strong. It's shown that it has the ability to turn out. And his problem are these swing voters. And those aren't necessarily um, uh, Haley voters right now. We, we haven't seen these voters show up as swing voters in the past. Sure, some of them are suburban women. And we see today uh, in the campaigns really targeting suburban women. And so there is an emerging of a, a, a general election narrative, which is what we left off of four years ago, which is highly likely suburban women decide how this election is going to be determined and whether or not Donald Trump can convince suburban women that he can protect them. Yeah. And, and Joe Biden can convince suburban women that he can protect their rights. Well, Rick, we heard that from Donald Trump when he was speaking in Grand Rapids, Michigan yesterday. He talked about how, and he called them suburban housewives, how they like him because they know he will protect them from things like crime. That was just one of many things he said in those remarks. Joe has alluded to this several times already this hour, doubling down on the bloodbath 
phrasing, talking about the bloodbath at the border. There's a whole website now dedicated to Biden's bloodbath. He again referred to migrants as animals. Is that going to help him with those voters that you are talking about, with those suburban women and other Haley voters that he might need to win over? Or is that doubling down only effective with his base? Yeah, this is a classic good versus evil, right? Uh, Joe Biden's campaign on the fact that he's actually turned the corner and America's better now than it was under Trump. And Trump is exactly the opposite. Oh my God, America is in a disastrous place, overrun by criminals. They've unleashed their you know, uh, mental patients and, and, and drug addicts and, and, and thieves and murderers into our country. Uh, no one is safe anywhere. And with only I can save you in the future. And so, so these two contrasts, uh, both on policy and on style, are going to play out. And, and I would say it's so early to have this hot a rhetoric. I mean, it's like Donald Trump can't help himself. He continues to pile on with incredibly high uh, rhetoric like bloodbath. And now it was applied initially to the car business, and now it's being applied to your, your security at the border. Uh, I can't wait to see what bloodbath happens next. I do think you run the risk. Uh, if you're Trump, of overusing these really hot adjectives, because what's going to happen sooner or later is people just become immune to it. And, oh, that's just another Donald yeah. Trump bloodbath comment. If it's used once in an important speech or or at a time in, in very important in the campaign, it has an enormous impact, I am certain. Uh, but if it's used every single day at every single rally, it just loses its impact. That's interesting. I wonder if it's already happening, uh, Rick. It's a great point. Jim, I wonder what Joe Biden does about it as well. Uh, recalling the way he embraced the term Bidenomics, which was critical, something that was in a Wall Street Journal column, and he kept hearing it enough that he said, OK, let's own this thing. And he kind of did. Uh, Donald Trump's essentially done the same thing with the bloodbath remark here, except to Kaylee's point, the RNC website, they bought the URL bidenbloodbath.com. What does the president or his campaign do with it? Well, I guess it's not about the auto industry anymore. Um, mm. look, I, I think it is imperative on, let's put aside the words bloodbath, okay? Because Democrats are gonna run to the outrage all the time and I don't think that works either. Yeah. Democrats and Joe Biden think they have an ace in a hole, ace in the hole with suburban women in particular on abortion and they do but they can't turn the immigration and crime issue and change the subject to abortion. They have to win back some of those voters who disapprove of Biden on the border and on crime issues. And they do have a story to tell, the bipartisan border deal that Trump killed because it would have helped Joe Biden um, and you know would have helped the country. They have to tell that story and not change the subject because if you can draw closer on the border and on the crime issue and close that gap with Trump, he will win this election. But you can't just change the subject to abortion. Well, Rick, if we're talking about the issues that resonate with voters, sure, we have seen repeatedly in the midterms in 2020 and special elections since then that abortion does have the ability to galvanize voters, to drive turnout and in overwhelmingly those rights have been protected every time they've come up uh, on the ballot. But it's not ranking as highly in terms of especially swing state voters and what they're prioritizing. It's the border and the economy. How do you think these different arguments are ultimately going, going to measure up? Yeah, I think that anybody who ignores the economy as the number one issue is missing the reports and that we're seeing in all the this, all this swing states. Uh, it's still the economy. That's what's really pinching people who are swing voters. That's what people are going to make their initial decisions on as to where to sit on this this ballot, whether it's Biden or Trump or some third party. And so I think that that all this rhetoric around, you know, these other issues is playing around on the edges of American politics. That being said, just recently this week, uh, a uh, a ballot initiative in Arizona on abortion uh, to change the state constitution uh, was collected enough signatures to make it on the ballot. Those kinds of things do have a tendency to drive turnout amongst certain groups. So if there is a less intense uh, feeling around abortion issues, but you have a ballot initiative where people are spending money, time and effort campaigning on it, and it's gonna be on the ballot, that could change the dynamics in a state where you know, Joe Biden only won by 10,000 votes last time. So I think you gotta look mm -hmm. underneath the hood and see beyond the economy 
what else is driving turnout at the state level. All right, Rick Davis, Bloomberg Politics contributor, and Jim Kessler, Democratic strategist, joining us from Third Way. Thank you both. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Joe, as we run through the various issues that are weighing on the minds of voters, this brings us back to the uninstructed, uncommitted uh, question that we know uh, showed up in Democratic primary voters yesterday, especially, and that is Israel and Gaza and the Biden administration's handling of this, especially in light of the development in recent days, the deaths of seven humanitarian aid workers from World Central Kitchen. This morning, Jose Andres, of course, the founder, the famed chef who uh, founded World Central Kitchen, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, it's entitled Let People Eat. And in part, it reads, in the worst conditions after the worst terrorist attack in its history, it's time for the best of Israel to show up. You cannot save the hostages by bombing every building in Gaza. You cannot win this war by starving an entire population. And it's on this note, we go now to Jonathan Panikoff, director at the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Jonathan, it's always great to have you here on Bloomberg Television and Radio, even though we do have to deal with some pretty heavy stuff. We're talking about even more deaths of humanitarian aid workers. Obviously, there have already been many. There's been deaths of tens of thousands of innocent civilians as well. And there is a growing outcry. It feels almost as if this is something of a turning point in terms of international outrage potentially at Israel and its conduct during this war. Are we about to see something really change here? Thanks for having me. Always good to be with you. Look, this hits home in a way I think just previous incidents didn't, frankly, to the dismay of many in the Middle East and especially in Gaza. The reality is Jose Andres is a beloved figure in the Washington community. He's incredibly close to the White House. But you had an American killed. You had a British national killed in addition to Palestinians killed. And so I think it's just really the culmination of a lot of frustration. The Biden administration has been on about this for months now. And you had last month, you know, the stampede. You had multiple Palestinians killed. There's a real question Mm -hmm. of why up until now hasn't there been a plan that's been effective and been implemented for humanitarian aid distribution? The fact that we're six months in and still not there, I think rightly is really unnerving folks in Washington to a degree that we haven't seen previously. Indeed, Washington loves Jose Andres. I can remember when it was the D.C. Central Kitchen before uh, he went worldwide. Uh, And Joe Biden, most of the lawmakers we're going to be talking with about this over the coming days have met him. They've probably volunteered uh, at the at the central kitchen here in town. I wonder to the extent knowing that he's been in touch with Joe Biden, this is going to influence President Biden's conversation tomorrow with Benjamin Netanyahu. Axios is now reporting that they will speak. What does Joe Biden tell Netanyahu tomorrow when they get on the line? I think the message is going to be pretty strong and pretty clear. Frankly, the Israelis not only have to allow in more humanitarian aid, they have to massively increase the opportunities for it to get in. So it's not just the seaport that the U.S. is building that's going to take a few months. It means actually opening up maybe every crossing Israel has and for the Israelis to coordinate in a way they haven't previously. Israel has said they've got a new joint operations center to coordinate with humanitarian organizations providing aid. I think that's going to be critical and should be helpful in ensuring such a tragedy doesn't happen again. But it's very, very late, and it's way past time that it should have happened. And I expect the president to frankly say that to Netanyahu. I think the president's patience is running out. Whether that means that there will be actually a call that if Netanyahu doesn't do this, there'll be some conditions imposed, I think that's a little unknown and what we're all going to be looking for. Well, I want to expand on that point, Jonathan, because, of course, at the same time, the same day, we got news of these seven uh, aid workers being killed in um, several Israeli strikes in succession. We got news that the U.S. is pushing ahead with $18 billion in arms sales, including fighter jets for Israel. So if there's no actual stoppage of the lethal aid that in part is empowering Israel to conduct these kind of operations that are having uh, a catastrophic toll on what you could maybe classify as collateral damage, then what leverage does Biden even have really in these conversations? 
It's a real challenge. A lot of folks, rightfully, just as you're bringing up, have talked about the U.S. needing to use its leverage. The problem is the U.S. leverage when it comes to Israel is big ticket items that have fundamentally underpinned the U.S.-Israel relationship for years now. So it is major defense hardware like the F-15s that we're talking about being sold, major bombs, intelligence sharing. The odds that you want to stop any of that is probably pretty low. The problem is if you don't do that or, or something like the UN Security Council not vetoing resolutions, mm -hmm. then there's not a lot of low hanging fruit. We've seen the Biden administration try to have sanctions put on folks in the West Bank settlers. You certainly could see more of that. But it's a real policy dilemma because it's not going zero to 25 if you condition the sale of arms with Israel. It's going zero to 60. You'd be fundamentally changing the relationship. So, yes, you can do it, but it's going to create a completely different dynamic that we haven't seen for a lot of years. And U.S. policymakers would have to make sure that they're ready for that as well. And I'm not sure either Israel or the U.S. would be ready for that, what that would entail. Jonathan, we haven't been hearing a lot about hostages lately, certainly not American hostages. Uh, but I can tell you that we now know in the wake of uh, the killing, the accidental killing, albeit of these workers at World Central Kitchen, more than 200 humanitarian aid workers have died uh, since October 7, including nearly two dozen Americans. If two dozen Americans died in any other country, that would be a front page story. How come progressive Democrats aren't making more of them. I think it's an excellent point, and my guess is you're about to hear them raise those same figures and, and, and stats as well. The reality is the number of aid workers have died ties directly to the problem that the Biden administration is having and the fundamental lack of Israeli strategy to get humanitarian support and humanitarian aid into Gaza. It's going to be a political challenge as well. We already know that it's going to add to it. I think that the question is, for a long time now, we saw this with the UN Security Council resolution, Israel has been wanting to tie the hostages um, fundamentally to uh, the question of whether or not there is even a temporary ceasefire. And, and there was anger about mm -hmm. whether the last UN resolution didn't do that sufficiently. But the truth of the matter is, there's a call for humanitarian aid because, as Jose Andre said in his op-ed, this is just about fundamentally people eating. Whether the hostages are alive, whether there's a ceasefire, there's still a need for a famine not to massively break out that would actually undermine Israel's ability to prosecute its war even more. And so I, I think there's going to have to be, a, a, frankly, a change in direction, and hopefully President Biden will be able to get that message across and it will actually be taken on in a meaningful way by Israeli counterparts. Jonathan, thank you. It's good to have you back. Jonathan Panikoff, director of the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council with us today. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.